and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Well, this is a big weekend for us, isn't it? The 4th of July, the official beginning of summer. But most importantly, uh, it's the day on which 247 years ago, we declared our independence from e England. The day we became a free people, no longer living under the oppression of English rule or their tyrant king. Not meaning to reflect on the current king, by the way. That declaration of independence would, of course, have been meaningless had we not defeated the Brits in the American Revolution. But we did. We sent them packing after General Cornwallis surrendered to General Washington at Yorktown five years later. No, the Redcoats would return in 1812, but once again, we sent them back across the waters with their tail between their legs. Today, we remember our nation's birthday with parades and, and flags and fireworks and hot dogs on the grill. I don't know about today, it's supposed to rain later, but. But it was through that victory that we became one nation under God, enabling us to live and worship in peace. And I believe we need to cherish and protect those freedoms and honor the men and women who sacrifice so much to preserve them. Because the freedom we enjoy as Americans is a pretty precious thing among the governments of the earth. But in today's epistle, we're reminded of a freedom even more precious, and that's our freedom from trying to measure up to God's law. A law that is holy and just to be sure, but a law that was forever condemning us because of our failure to perfectly obey God's righteous demands. A law that showed us how miserably unable we were to free ourselves from our bondage to Satan, sin, and death. You see, our American citizenship guarantees us freedom from earthly tyrants. But our citizenship in heaven guarantees our freedom from Satan, the greatest tyrant of them all. And that freedom gives us true peace in this world and in the next. Actually, you know, there's a lot of similarities between the freedoms that we enjoy as Americans and the freedoms that we enjoy in Christ. Our freedom as Americans was only one after a, a costly war with England. We are a free people, but we've had to fight many wars since that time to ensure that we remain so. Our victory in Christ was also won as a result of a war, not against earthly armies, but against the powers and principalities of Satan himself. Jesus won that war for us in his suffering, death, and resurrection from the dead. And his victory has granted us the forgiveness of sins to be sure. But it's also set us free from the inevitable effects of that sin, eternally, eternal suffering and death in hell. That war has been won. Our victory in Christ is certain. Nevertheless, Satan is still at work, attacking us where we're weak in an effort to get us to doubt the salvation that we have. You see, the devil's ultimate goal is to drive us to despair so that we will turn our backs on the Lord. The victory has been won, no doubt about it, but Satan doesn't want to surrender. He knows he's toast. He knows his time is short. And so out of jealous anger, he rages against God by trying to drag as many of God's people down with him as he can. He wants to put all of the faithful, pull all of the faithful away from Christ. And one of the primary ways that he does that is by continually hitting us over the head with God's law. You see, the law is a double-edged sword. 
God gave it to his people, first of all, to set them apart from the lawless actions of the rest of the world. But God also gave us the law as a means of salvation. As the Lord says in Ezekiel chapter 20, I gave them my statutes and made known to them my rules by which if a person does them, he shall live. Well, the problem is we were doomed from the beginning, not because of the law. The law is good and perfect and holy. Rather, we were doomed because of our sin. Trying to achieve righteousness, holiness, through obedience to the law is a crushing weight on our backs. As St. Peter said, it's a burden neither we nor our fathers could bear. Why? Because it's continually pointing its righteous finger at us, showing us how we fail to measure up. Just look at the first and most important commandment. You shall have no other gods, meaning we are to worship no one else but the one holy and triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He is to be foremost in our lives. If we're in a right relationship with him, everything else will fall into line. If we were somehow able to keep just that single commandment, we would automatically keep the other commandments as well. That's what got Adam and Eve in trouble. You see, they wanted to become gods themselves by putting the desires of their hearts above the will of God. The Israelites continually failed as well. Oh, sure, they would come back to God for a time, and then they would start worshiping other gods once again. And we're the same way. We're continually putting our will above the will of the Lord. And if we can't keep that first commandment, how could we possibly expect to keep the other nine? And so because of our sinful nature, we don't see God's law as a, a way to everlasting life. Instead, we see it as a goal that's impossible to attain. The law is continually reminding us of what miserable sinners we are, deserving of nothing but hell and damnation rather than the love, mercy, and grace of God. You know, we're like the rich young man who asked Jesus, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? To which Jesus replied, you know the commandments. Do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and mother. And the rich young man said, all these I have kept from my youth. Yeah, right, sure you did. That's what I would have said, but Jesus didn't say that. Jesus said, Jesus looked at him and loved him and said to him, you lack one thing. Go sell all that you have and give it to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. And the young man turned and walked away sorrowful because he had great possessions. You see, he may have been able to follow the other commandments, but he failed at keeping the first commandment. He loved his possessions more than he loved the Lord. Folks, if we look at how supposedly good we are as a way of earning God's favor, we're toast, game over, because we're all horribly sinful people. We do things and think things that condemn us every day. We deserve nothing good from God, nada. Sin is a serious business. It's a deadly business. And we, who know God, what God's law demands and who break it anyway, anyway are doubly condemned. We are absolutely crushed under the weight of the moral law because of the sin that reigns in our hearts. Left to ourselves, we are eternally lost before we've even begun. So if you think you're worthy of salvation because you're a pretty good person, you'd better think again because God is the one who judges 
And God demands perfection all the time, every time. As I said, sin is a deadly business, and it took the death of someone to free us from it. Someone who could do what we never could do. Someone who could obey God's law perfectly on our behalf and credit that obedience to us. And that, of course, was our Lord, Jesus Christ. That in itself is incredible. But then Jesus did something even more incredible. After living that perfectly obedient life, Jesus went to the cross, suffering the punishment that we deserve for our failure to live as we should. Jesus suffered death and hell for us, so we never would. Friends, that's the very definition of mercy, not having to face the punishment that one deserves. And you know, God could have stopped there. Rather than face eternal suffering for our sins, he could have just committed us to an oblivion of non-existence. But he didn't. He gave us his grace. And he did that when he raised his son from the dead as a guarantee that all who trust in Jesus will live forever with him. Okay, folks, you've no doubt heard all of this a thousand times. It's the basic theology of our Christian faith. But you know, I'm not really sure that we appreciate the implications of the victory that Jesus won for us. And I'm not sure that we totally believe it. On more than one occasion, I have sat at the bedside of a dying parishioner who was not certain of their salvation. And I'm talking about lifelong Lutherans who were weaned on the gospel of grace. You know, Pastor, I just don't think I'm good enough. To which I've had to reply, you're right, you're not. But Jesus is, and he forgives you. That assurance gives us true peace. No other faith has the peace and comfort that Jesus gives. Because of our disobedience, we deserve nothing but hell, but God doesn't condemn us. Instead, he gives us what we don't deserve, everlasting life in a recreated world without suffering or sickness or pain or death. That's a reality we need to own, and we need to start living like we believe it. Only then will Satan stop berating us because of our sin. Friends, thanks to Jesus, we are redeemed children of God, and that enables us to view the law in an entirely different way. No longer do we regard it as an unattainable goal that we must achieve for salvation. Rather, through the forgiveness of Jesus, we see it as a guide by which we may live in thanksgiving to our gracious and merciful God. The law once loomed as a terror over us, condemning us with its every dot and tittle. But now, in holy baptism, we have died to our old nature so that we're in bondage to the law no longer. We are a new people, a risen people, set free by the love of Christ. And having been set free by love, we serve in love, bearing fruit worthy of Jesus and the freedom that he won for us. You know, it's fun to celebrate our independence as Americans on the 4th of July. It's even better to rejoice in the freedom from death and hell that Jesus won for us in his death and resurrection. We celebrate that freedom and rejoice in that victory every Sunday morning. But we live in that freedom every day of our lives. And through faith in Jesus, that is a life that will never end. To him be the glory, now and forever. Amen.